and tried to go in again. And Napoleon sent another 5,000. So you've got 10,000 men heading up a front that's only about a thousand yards across. So it's an impossible task. Again, it's like Agincourt. If you squeeze the cavalry into a narrow front, they're going to have a lot of problems. And there wasn't a single British square that was actually punctured by those cavalry attacks. And Ney was so frustrated, he was seen hacking at a cannon with his, with his sword. But no one among the French thought to spike the cannons. Hello. And welcome to Bloody Violent History. My name is Tom Ashton, and with my old friend James Jackson, we're going to talk about moments from history that tell us who we are, how we got here, and perhaps where we're heading. And it's often violent and generally quite bloody. Jamie, hello, and welcome back for another session with Bloody Violent History. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. Today we have a talk about cavalry and the cavalry charge, occasionally a battle-winning event, but more often an heroic action ending in mayhem, bloodshed and disaster. That's right, Tom. It's either a byword for dash and daring or reckless folly and military catastrophe. So <laughs> on a good day, it can do extraordinary things. Cavalry at its best is about shock and awe. It creates huge energy, huge speed, huge impact. And it can roll up uh, the flank of an enemy or punch straight through. And it's there to dominate the battlefield, to turn a battle. And if it doesn't punch through, if it's bogged down, if it meets a well-dug-in enemy, uh, an enemy that's prepared, that's when things can go terribly wrong. And you saw that at so many places, such as the Charge of the Light Brigade in 1854. You saw it with Ney's cavalry, the French cavalry in 1815. Those are the disasters. You saw it at Agincourt in 1415. So all the way through history, there are these events that show the cavalry, when it goes wrong, when it is blunted and halted and diverted, then they can be cut to pieces. It's, yeah, quickly it can turn into a catastrophe. Yes, it can. And the very quick actions, it's worth remembering one of the successful ones, the charge of the heavy brigade on the same day as the charge of the light brigade, uh, was an eight-minute action and routed 2,000 Russian cavalry. So it can have a huge effect. Uh, Winston Churchill, who took part in the charge at Omdurman in 1898, called it the two most dangerous minutes of his life, and probably the two most exhilarating minutes of his life. And, and yeah, and I mean, he was a man who was shot at at least half a dozen times. Well, and who crashed four times, who was knocked down in New York by a car. So he really means it when he says it's the most extraordinarily dangerous experience. And, and so it is essentially a one-shot weapon. Yeah, well, even in my very modest time in, in the cavalry uh, many years ago, um, one of my fellow cavalry officers was briefed by his CEO, by his colonel when he joined the regiment, to, and told that he should really do something dangerous once a day. And that was really all that was required of him, you know, whether it was to go hunting or to go and jump out of an aeroplane or do something like that. He said, basically do something dangerous every day. The only exception, apparently, to that was he wasn't allowed to sleep with the colonel's wife. <laughs> Which would have been truly dangerous. Indeed. <laughs> but, but it's not just about the men. It's also, obviously, about the horses. If you want uh, 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 the, the sort of blueprint, the archetype of the most brilliant cavalry horse, it would obviously have to be the original war horse, warrior. Uh, the horse that belonged, the charger that belonged to General Jack Seeley. Uh, this is this is from the uh, which um, Michael Morpurgo based his book War Horse on. Yes, and and uh, he took part uh, both both Seeley, who led the charge, and Warrior, the, the that he was mounted on, uh, led the charge uh, with the signals troop um, to initiate uh, the fantastic charge at uh, Moroy Wood. 
1918, March 1918. And Warrior as a Horse knew what he was doing. He had survived four years. He was known in the press as the horse the Germans couldn't kill. And he became completely impervious to shell fire. A few days before the, the main uh, charge, he was stabled inside the, a French villa and was eating oats off an ormolu table. And a shell, a German shell, hit the villa and the whole place exploded. The top floor collapsed onto Warrior and Warrior was just standing there completely unfazed. And they removed the rubble and the walls of the building had gone. They removed the rubble and he just hopped out. And so he was completely impervious to that. But he he said, he said seemed to understand, as Seeley put it, uh, exactly what bullets were about. He was nose to nose with another horse when the other horse was shot and killed. And Warrior didn't flinch. But in the charge, he knew that even at a gallop, he had to weave to avoid bullets. So he just went from left to right. Um, and he, he was a spectacular horse. Um, I should think in all times uh, w w when cavalry have been deployed over the over the centuries that there have been certain horses who are kind of, well, like certain soldiers who were well above the average. And I mean, certainly we had a, a bit of an example of that in the early 80s when the household cavalry, um, there was a bomb attack on Knightsbridge and a lot of horses were killed. And one of the horses that survived but was uh, wounded and filled with shrapnel was a horse called Sefton. And um, he was a, a cantankerous, I never met him personally, but he was a very tough horse. Uh, in fact, I did meet him one, on one occasion. And and the guy who was sort of looking after him said, you know, the thing about Sefton, well, rather like when we, we spoke about um, Wellington's horse, Copenhagen, is that they were tough, these horses, and, and they, they, you know, they, they would get through it, but they wouldn't, um, they were no softies at all. They'd give you a kick in the pants if they thought they could get away. Well, and, and Warrior hated being behind other horses. He wanted to lead. He got the, his, the blood in his nostrils. Seeley often writes that Warrior took control, and basically Warrior started to gallop, and there was no way of controlling him. He just... He just went for it. It sounds like it was Colonel Seeley, but General Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably the way it was. I mean, there was one instant where he had to walk behind a tank and got terribly put out by it. And the other thing that Warrior hated doing was withdrawing or, or, or retreating. He, 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 it absolutely got him hot under the collar. Uh, he, he wanted to charge. He wanted to take on the enemy. Great. Well, that's a good, that's a very good start. I think what we might do now is talk about some of the actions, talk about some of those infamous and famous cavalry charges um, over the last uh, few centuries and start with the Crusaders. They're a good place to start because they are really the epitome of European cavalry, the start of heavy cavalry. And one of the best examples was the Battle of the Horns of Hattin on the 4th of July, 1187. Unfortunately for the Crusaders, they were up against the great strategist and tactician Saladin. And Saladin had crossed the Jordan River, attacked the town of Tiberias, and basically tempted the Crusaders from the coast, the army to come from the coast. 22,000 of them and 1,200 knights. Saladin simply either poisoned the wells or redirected the water or removed the water. And so by the time they got to uh, the Horns of Hattin, which is this rather desolate place near the Sea of Galilee, they had had no water. They then took up position, the, the mounted knights on one horn, one escarpment, and the 22,000 foot soldiers on the other. What Saladin did, he set fire to the brushwood around. He got his Mutawiya religious soldiers to set fire to it. So there was smoke coming in, there were flames, the heat of the day. This was midsummer. The infantry drifted off towards the Sea of Galilee, desperate for water towards Lake Tiberius, as it were known. What you had left was simply the knights. And at one stage, Count Raymond of Tripoli took his knights, several hundred knights, and charged. What the Muslim army did was simply part, like the Red Sea, because they had 
signalers with flags, they had battle cries with whistles, and they could direct the army. So what, what they did, the army parted, the Count Raymond and his knights charged through, the army closed, and Count Raymond couldn't get back. That was the last they saw of him. That's the last they saw of him, as he headed for the, he headed for the coast. And here's an extract from James Jackson's historical thriller, Pilgrim. Now Saladin stood on a hilltop, a still figure attended by his emirs and Mamluk bodyguards, hemmed in by the armoured ranks of his Jandaria Praetorians, gazing down upon grim and violent spectacle. Fluttering above them were the black and green banners of their cause, the yellow dynastic pennants of the Ayyubids, the horsehair standards of the Turkomans, a gathering of the elite watching the inevitable. He gave a nod. Instantly the command was relayed by signalers waving flags, was received and sent on by the battlefield Jawash and Manadi criers stationed below. Their calls and whistles could be heard shrill through the clamour and clash of arms, redirecting and reorganising, ordering tactical feint and rapid manoeuvre. See, Count Raymond of Tripoli counterattacks! Count Raymond of Tripoli had misjudged his moment. Valour or folly, it made no difference. It was the wife of this nobleman who was besieged in the citadel at Tiberius, this nobleman who even so had cautioned against rash move upon Saladin. He understood the strength of the Muslim foe, had cried out on the arid and inland march that all was lost and they were dead men. It did not prevent him from taking his knights and sergeants at arms in headlong rush against the enemy swarm. Perhaps he could break out, create escape for the rest of his brethren. The response was immediate. As the Count plunged through the scrub fires and rolling banks of smoke, the entire army of Saladin opened wide. The velocity of the charge carried the Christians on. They could not halt or turn, could not withdraw to their beleaguered comrades or their starting line. Then they were passed, and the Muslim phalanxes closed once more. A simple trick a different method of combat that had further disabled the Crusaders. This sort of thing happened time and time with the Crusaders. Um, shortly before that, there was a, a situation at the Springs of Cresson where 150 Templars, the thugs of the period, uh, charged a recce column of a 1,000 Muslim horsemen and only three of them came out alive, including uh, their grandmaster, Gerard de Reedfort. So they didn't learn. Wind on four years, you have Richard the Lionheart, Coeur de Lyon, taking his army down the coast uh, from Acre that he had just managed to seize, down towards Jaffa. And the Hospitallers, the other great military order, were guarding the rear of the army. They decided to charge the Muslims who were attacking them, pestering them and har harassing them on the, on the flank. And they charged. And there are vivid descriptions of Richard uh, covered in arrow heads sticking into him. And, and, and he looked like a sort of animal covered in quills and covered in feathers. So it was pretty brutal. And against that, you have Muslim... Uh, cavalry of many varieties. You have heavy cavalry, light cavalry, you have Kurdish horse archers, a bit like dragoons later on who dismount to fire their bows. You have Turkomans who fire darts from their bows on the move from the saddle. So they're far more flexible than the Crusaders, whose only light cavalry really were Turkmans, renegade Muslims who had crossed to their side. So that was really the start. The Crusaders never recovered from the Battle of the Horns of Hattin. They lost Jerusalem after that, were pushed to the coast, mm -hmm. and for the next hundred years were stuck in their forts along the coast, hanging on. So that's where we start our story about the cavalry. Um, so wind on a, a couple of hundred years to Agincourt, the Battle of Agincourt, French versus the uh, English. Had we or had they learnt anything from their time as Crusaders? I don't think they had. They hadn't developed any greater flexibility. It was a different scenario. This time, the, the French knights were funneled into a killing zone. They were bogged down in the mud. They were facing stakes. And of course, they were facing English archers who could loose off six arrows a minute. So they were absolutely hacked to pieces. And, and the recurring theme 
of cavalry is that once you've been knocked from your horse, once you've dismounted, you are very vulnerable. And if they were lying on the ground, if they were wounded, you then faced uh, Welsh soldiers going out and basically putting a knife through their through their visors and killing them. So they were they were very vulnerable and 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 unable to manoeuvre. Uh, wasn't there also a problem with because um, the way um, people were paid in those days is is with a promise of plunder as opposed to being paid um, a, a wage or 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 being involved in a cause which you believed in so strongly that you it overrode your n- natural tendency to go and attack the baggage train and steal all the all stuff and that's why you never saw your cavalry again. Well, it overrode caution and if you wind on to 1664 in the English Civil War, you saw Prince Rupert doing his cavalry charge and this is a classic case of overreaching, over-enthusiasm and lack of discipline. Prince Rupert used to ride with his pet poodle boy in his saddlebag. <laughs> so it was it was a social jaunt as much as anything else. And it was all flash. It was all flash. And and, and if you're up against Fairfax or if you're you know, the new bottle army and the parliamentarian forces who were very disciplined, it was very difficult to break through. And because he wasn't a bad cavalry commander, Prince Rupert was. He was just, it was just they were all just too kind of um Well he was young. Uh, and and they weren't necessarily experienced. And there were a lot of cavalry. I mean, at Marston Moor, there were 6,000. At Naseby, uh, he had just under 4,000. But at Naseby, one of the problems was that the parliamentarians uh, dismounted from their horses, their dragoons dismounted, took up position in hedgerows, started taking pot shots at them in musket fire. And Rupert saw no choice but to mount his charge, otherwise they'd be massacred. Well, this might be a useful moment just to pop in a note about um, from this time onwards, you tend to hear of cavalry's um, units being called heavy cavalry or cuirassier, and then you have dragoons and hussars. These are three names that occur time and again. And just a, a sort of a quick pen picture is that basically dragoons were mounted infantry. So the idea is they would, could move around on their horses and then they could hop off their horses with their rifles and they could engage as infantry. So they were less, they didn't have to be trained quite so well. So at the beginning of conflicts, the dragoons would um, be usable as a force. And then as time went on, they would become a more and more effective force and would sort of morph into true cavalry units. Um, And the heavy cavalry would be the, on big horses, heavily armoured, Um, And the hussars would be lighter cavalry, often used for um, types of manoeuvre where they were required to get from A to B very quickly, perhaps reconnaissance and so on. So there was an element of interchangeability between the different units, but you do hear that heavy dragoon and hussar word. And it's one of the reasons that dragoons were often used in applying martial law and putting down insurrection because they were all-purpose troops, uh, mounted or dismounted. So they were were in a way more flexible than the others and used for, for, for many different... I mean, they were even used in England for tracking down smugglers and raiding and helping the civil authorities and uh, civil government. But Tom, the, these are all disasters. I mean, if you look at Naseby, of course, uh, Prince Rupert's cavalry overreached, got to the baggage train, which was defended, and got into a fight there. And by the time they'd sorted that out, they couldn't even get back to the main battle and had to just leave the battlefield. So those are the weaknesses of the cavalry, the problems of the cavalry. But come Frederick the Great, all things changed. Yes, well, Frederick the Great was, became the king of Prussia in 1740 and basically inherited a rotten cavalry. He had some well-trained Prussian infantry and, in fact, um, in his early encounters on the battlefield, it was really the infantry who saved the day. He was fortunate to have good commander, which I'll come on to in a minute. But basically, only three years later, having having trained up his cavalry, he had the most spectacular uh, result at the charge of the Bayreuth Dragoons at 
Holand Friedberg in um, 1745 with uh, 1,500 horses. He managed to disperse 20 Austrian battalions, capture 2,500 prisoners, and he captured 67 colours, which will rank as one of the most brilliant feats in military history. And he was fortunate, um, and he carried on over the next um, several decades, his general Seidelitz, who was a, a great leader of cavalry. They really learned that if you're fighting a never-ending series of, of wars and battles, you can train your cavalry up to a very high standard so that you can keep them together when they go into the attack. You can recall them and you can position them around the battlefield. And rather than just lose them after the first shot, you can use them uh, on a number of occasions. And they are an incredibly effective force if the enemy you're facing is going a bit wobbly and you send your cavalry in as a wall with no sort of uh, weak spots in it. Uh, you'll just mow down everything, and it's an extremely successful, although extremely difficult thing to but achieve. But it takes great communication, great discipline, and great commanders. And I suppose it was the precursor to Blitzkrieg, you know, that, that you, you can see the damage that heavy cavalry can do if it is well commanded and well constructed. But then you see the other side. There's always a counterstroke because what happened was that the enemy, or principally the French, started coming up with tactics that could blunt those charges. Again, this is what you see throughout history, that, that it reverted to the old, old thing that if you had good defences, cavalry could be stopped. Yes. Waterloo is a good example of that. Waterloo is a great example of that, and and uh, the, the the French cavalry weren't up to what they once were, and Ney, Marshal Ney, was was not up to what he once was. His judgment was pretty shot at, at Waterloo. Towards the afternoon, he got reports that the English were retreating, when in fact it was simply the wounded being put on carts and sent back. And so he sends in his cavalry. He got them mustered at the foot of Mont Saint Jean, the, the famous ridge line uh, on top of which the Brits were were stationed. And uh, but also the Brits were the, Brit the the British army was on a reverse slope, wasn't it? So you couldn't see what was going on particularly well. No, he couldn't. And and but what happened was that when he got to the top, the first thing they encountered was the artillery firing grape shots. So they were absolutely winnowed as soon as they reached the ridge line. And then they confronted or were confronted by the squares of English troops. Uh, not to make excuses for the French cavalry. <laughs> um, but one of the problems that Napoleon had with his cavalry, I mean, he was after all an artillery man originally, but was that even from the time of the revolution, basically all the decent sort of uh, riders, cavalry, horses, and so on, had been linked through to the aristocracy who'd been pushed out of the way with the revolution. So by the time he had his army put together, and obviously this was when he'd come back from Elba, um, that the cavalry weren't highly trained. They were loyal, and there were a lot of them. Um, but you couldn't actually rely, like uh, Frederick the Great, on their precise uh, use. So he basically, Napoleon before he'd even get Ney took it on, pre-positioned his cavalry um, with an idea of what he was going to do with it. So rather than just having them on the flanks and in reserve and to deploy at any particular point that was an exploitable weakness, he had an idea that he was going to punch through when he'd softened up the British with artillery and so on. And he was going to deploy them through, through the middle they sort of pushed the button on this plan and it was a disaster. Well, they had lost their flexibility by that stage. Napoleon didn't deploy them correctly and they didn't deploy them correctly. I mean, first of all, you had 5,000 going in. The, the, you know, they were confronted by rows of British soldiers firing at them. They then galloped on, tried to swerve, were hit by more squares. And then when they were in absolute disarray. They retreated down the slope, dead horses, dead men everywhere, and tried to go in again. And Napoleon sent another 5,000. So you've got 10,000 men heading up a front that's only about 1,000 yards across. So it's an impossible task. Again, it's like Agincourt. If you squeeze the cavalry into a narrow front, 
they're going to have a lot of problems. And there wasn't a single British square that was actually punctured by those cavalry attacks. And Ney was so frustrated, he was seen hacking at a cannon with his, with his sword. But no one among the French thought to spike the cannons in case they, in case they wanted to make another charge. So what happened? The, the gunners who had run back into the British squares ran forward again and fired at them again with grape shot. So it's hardly surprising that by the end of the day, the French cavalry had 47% casualties. That's almost 5,000. So it was, it was a dreadful, dreadful day for, well, we all know it's a dreadful day for the French, but for the French cavalry, it just, it just killed them. Yeah, and it was really the start of, I know there were one or two other um, tense actions, but that was a, a, um, a moment really where things started to fall apart for Napoleon. Also on that day, there were a, there was a, a famous British encounter with the cavalry, which which kind of went well and badly at the same time. The charge of the uh, Union Brigade, the Scots Greys, when the infantry latched onto the sides of the charging Scotsmen, and they all were pulled into the French, and it was a, a tremendous encounter where where they uh, did a huge amount of damage, but then they overshot what they were meant to do, and they ended up far too far in front of Wellington's army. And then the French uh, light cavalry came in with their lancers and basically put them down. It was a gruesome business. And here is an extract from Georgette Hayer's historical novel, An Infamous Army, which has a great description of the Battle of Waterloo, including the charge of the Union Brigade. There was a yell of, Now then, Scots Greys! and the next instant the whole of the Union Brigade came thundering up the reverse slope. The French, disordered through their inability to deploy their enormous column before the Highlanders, charged them, appalled hardly more by the fury of the kilted devils who rushed on them than by the unearthly music of the pipes playing Scots were hay in the hell of blood and smoke and clashing arms that filled the valley, heard the cavalry thundering towards them, and looked up to see great grey horses clearing the hedge above them. They fell back. In the valley, officers were shouting to the Gordons to wheel back by sections to let the cavalry pass through. The Scots greys tightened their grips, and came slipping and scrambling down the banks, shouting, Hurrah! Ninety-second! Scotland forever! as they caught sight of the red-feathered bonnets in the press in the smoke below. Greys, royals, and inniskillings, riding almost abreast, poured over the hedge and down into the seething valley. The Gordons were yelling, Go at them, the Greys! Scotland forever! and snatching at stirrup leathers as the Greys rode through them, so that they too were borne forwards in this terrific charge. Somewhere, lost in the smoke, a pipe major was coolly playing, Hey, Johnny Cope, are you walking yet? while all around sounded screams, shouts, musketry fire and the clash of steel. Many of the horses and their riders were brought down by the musket balls or the desperate thrust of bayonets. But the cavalry charge had caught Marconnet's column unawares and in confusion. The Union Brigade rode over the column, lopping off heads with their sabres, while the Gordons, who had been carried forward with them, did deadly work with the bayonets. To the right, where Donzelot's men had fought their way through Kemp's thin lines to the crest of the position, the Royal Dragoons, unchecked by the frontal fire that met them, charged straight for the leading column of the division. The column faced about and tried to retreat over the hedge, but there was no time to get to safety before the royals were in their midst, their sabres busy and their horses squealing, biting, and striking out with their iron-shod forefeet. Between the greys and the royals, the inner skillings with their blood-curdling howl broke through Donzelot's rear brigades. As the royals, capturing the eagle, charged on over the slaughtered leading column to the supporting ones behind it, and the greys rode down Marconnet's men. The French, utterly demoralised, began throwing down their arms and crying for quarter. Yes, yet again, there you have cavalry overreaching. It is so difficult to control them in the midst of a battle when not only the horses 
and their riders, but also, as you see in this case, infantry hanging onto the saddles, uh, clinging on between two horses, uh, being dragged towards the enemy. People just wanted to get in and close with the enemy. And, and, and that is, again, again, the strength and the weakness of cavalry in these sorts of battles. Okay, so towards the end of the day, Blucher arrives. What happens next? He manages to meet Wellington. His forces come through the woods. They meet up with the Brits. And that, of course, as we all know, saved the day. They had already suffered um, a terrible encounter with the French, and, but had survived and managed to withdraw and reach the battlefield just in time. Uh, Blucher was an extraordinary figure. He was loved by his men. He was old. He was pretty mad. Um, a few years after Waterloo, he was writing to Wellington, claiming he had been made pregnant by a bull elephant. Um, <laughs> and then he changed his mind and said he had been made pregnant by a French soldier. So <laughs> he was, let's just call him eccentric. Yeah. <laughs> but but as we all know, the, the cavalry made an extraordinary contribution at Waterloo and, and were, were extremely important, giving chase uh, to the routed French army and trying to catch up with Napoleon. Um, they never actually caught Napoleon there, but they did, they did come across his carriage and they managed to pinch quite a lot of the stuff that was in the carriage, including his cloak. <laughs> well, somebody had a warm night that night. Yeah, I think they probably did. Well, it's nice to be nice about the Prussians. Uh, that was probably the last time we were nice about the Prussians, wasn't it? <laughs> I think you're probably right. But, of course, the Prussians always learned the lesson. And they, they of course, then went on to refine the cavalry and come up with Blitzkrieg and tank warfare. So, uh, Our next encounter with the cavalry is uh, in the Crimea, French and uh, British allied against the Russians. Uh, Jamie, tell us a bit about Balaclava. Well, there were the British turning up with cavalry, of course. And it's always very difficult getting horses sorted out once they land, getting them in condition. There was a lot of criticism both then and ever since about the quality of the command structure and the officers, and, and hardly surprising. Yeah, well, most of the command commands were purchased, weren't they? Yes, people still still buy, still buy bought their commissions. Uh, so the quality was uh, pretty ragged. And, uh, you know, when people talk about Lord Cardigan, um, he, he basically owned his Hussar regiment. So. Yeah, this is a rich man who purchased it. <laughs> yes, yes, and, 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 and he lo absolutely loved and, and bought their, all, their, all their uniforms. <laughs> it was his personal fiefdom. The cherry picker trousers. Yes, but, but when you get to the charge of the heavy brigade, which was a su su successful part of the day, you had the Russians attacking. You had the Russian cavalry coming in, 2,000 of them, uh, heading straight through the outer defences, heading towards the famous uh, thin red line that manages to hold them. They then retreat into the ravines nearby, and they're spotted. And that is the point where the heavy brigade go in. This extract is taken from Sir Barney Whitespanner's book, Horse Guards, The History of the Household Cavalry. From Raglan's vantage point, he saw first Scarlet and his staff, then the three squadrons of the first line, swallowed up, lost and engulfed in the great grey Russian mass. And then suddenly they had not disappeared. Red coats were visible, bright specks of colour against the Russian grey. It took eight minutes for the black-looking mass to break and neither Lucan nor Cardigan thought to pursue them with the Light Brigade, an obvious opportunity which would have turned a tactical success into an important victory, and for which a mission Lucan was afterwards nicknamed Lord Lucon. It's an amazing encounter because they charge far fewer numbers than the Russians. They get to the gallop. It's an eight-minute encounter. So again, you get an idea of, of how rapid these, these, not just skirmishes, but even the battles can be. And it was eight minutes before the Russians were routed and they got to the Russians, were enveloped in them. And you, you, there are descriptions of the seeing sort of flashes of scarlet, the uniforms of the British against the gray and black of the Russians. What's fascinating about that encounter is 
the descriptions of how bad the swords were. Apparently, the British swords bent <laughs> and couldn't get through the Russian greatcoats. And the Russian swords apparently were blunt. So they were just sort of pummeling each other. That, I suppose, sets the, the scene and the trend for decades, if not centuries, of bad British military equipment from terrible boots during the Falklands War to snatch Land Rovers and SA-80 rifles in the 2000s. Yeah, we're very good at that. We're very good at sending <laughs> our soldiers into impossible situations with rotten weapons. Well, I suppose it helps improvisation. Yes. But at least the heavy brigade won out that day and, and for the loss of 10 men. So it shows that if, if shock and awe is there, if surprise is there, they can achieve a result. And then we get to the Light Brigade. Now, that was a disaster and a half and has entered legend and folklore. Uh, one of the problems was that uh, Lord Lucan, in charge of the cavalry, had not deployed the Light Brigade to follow up the success of the Heavy Brigade. So what started as a rout of the Russians did not lead to their destruction. It earned him the nickname of Lord Lucon. Uh, he was very loath to commit, was often in argument with all the other officers, senior officers, uh, over where to deploy the cavalry and how to deploy the cavalry. What happened was the muddle over the guns, essentially. Uh, Lord Raglan had uh, spotted that the Russians were trying to take guns they had captured and tow them away. And so he sent Captain Nolan... Uh, to take a message uh, to Lord Lucan saying, uh, we want the cavalry to advance. We want you to take those guns. And as we all know, th the wrong valley, the North Valley, was where the cavalry uh, decided to advance. So 670 men of the Light Brigade, led by Lord Cardigan, uh, went up the valley and disaster struck. There's a there's a sort of story that that Nolan took off in front of them all and tried to stop them because he realised that the wrong guns controlled a battery controlled by the Don Cossacks um, was the target and it was the wrong target. So he tried to stop them and was mortally wounded by a, a shell splinter, and his horse turned back. And he went back to the starting point and fell dead off the horse. Um, Cardigan continues with this charge, his 670 men. They get to the guns, spike the gun, but then they're attacked by Cossacks and Lancers at the other end who are waiting behind the guns. And that's where the, the, the terrible melee starts. There's a, a, a big skirmish there. The retreat is sounded and they start making their way back. And by the time they get back, they've lost 118 dead, 127 wounded, 60 have been uh, taken capture. And by the time they muster again, there are only 195 still on their horses. So uh, less than a third of the original number are still mounted um, and not necessarily on their horses. So it, it was a complete catastrophe. And it's small wonder that a French general said uh, it may be magnificent, but it's not war. It certainly was. And anyone who saw that charge, I think, would, would never, have, never have forgotten it. And, and straight after, the recriminations began. And none of the senior generals liked each other anyway. Um, there is a uh, an, an extraordinary footnote to the whole story because there was a captain, Adolphus Cook, from the 11th Hussars, who took part in the charge. And he wrote a letter to his parents afterwards describing in detail what had happened to him. And it's never been seen by historians, but uh, I had the luck to have it read to me. It is the most extraordinary story because he talks about hearing a rattling sound as he as he makes his way back along the valley and he turns around and sees cossacks behind him they're about a foot away and he manages manages to sort of parry a blow and then continue on and, and luckily the guns open up either side again the russian guns the russian cossacks fall back his horse is hit he's hit in the leg and he limps back, takes him half an hour to limp back up the valley. He is the last man out 
of the charge of the Light Brigade. And he ended up on a, on a hospital ship. And he writes in his letter to his parents that everyone on the sunny side of the ship died of their wounds. He, however, was in the dark side of the ship in the hold and grew this strange green mold on his leg. And he survived. So you could also say that not only was he the last man out of the valley of death, but uh, he discovered penicillin 100 years or so before Alexander Fleming. Yes, well, that'll have a, a few people irritated. <laughs> well, he, 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 he discovered it by default. Yes, by chance. Yes, but it, uh, it certainly saved his life. But this, uh, I mean, after the Battle of Waterloo, which is 1815, and this is taking place in 1854, there'd been no sort of major encounters on the continent. This was the problem with the cavalry, that they sort of went to sea, they become, you know, they already had the nickname of being sort of Piccadilly soldiers and, and, and all of that. And the, and the problem is that to be highly trained and also be in the area, they were in, you know, the Crimea, a long way from home, having transported, as you said, their horses, who probably weren't match fit by then, and were eating different fodder from what they were used to. And these guys hadn't had much practice. They might look fancy in their pink trousers, but they really weren't. Uh, drilled and trained enough to to do anything other than go in one direction and that was it. You never saw them again. And there was a terrible drink problem. There's no doubt that the cavalry, I suppose even to this day, has a reputation, uh, firstly for aristocratic credentials and also for not being great tacticians. I mean, I know that's a controversial thing to say, but obviously with the arrival of the tank, that, that changed. But it was more horsemanship and breeding that counted more than brilliant military minds. Well, it was always the case that the cavalry was part of the, the core, and therefore you, as a cavalry leader like Uxbridge at Waterloo or, or, or whoever, there was always someone over you. There was always a directing general above you who was going to place you into a situation which you then had to deal with. So Raglan gave the order to Lucan and Lucan gave the order to Cardigan. Yes, yeah, so you might as well party in between. And they knew how to do that. And, 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 and sometimes it worked. I mean, if you wind on a bit to 1882 and the, the fantastic charge by uh, the household cavalry at Kassassin Lock, when the Egyptians rose up and were heading for the Suez Canal and the British responded, uh, and, and the cavalry did that amazing charge, the, 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 the moonlight charge, uh, across the sands and, and, and took out the Egyptians. But they were dealing with, with essentially a rabble and managed to take 11 guns. Um, so it was certainly more successful than the charge of the Light They only lost six men in that charge. Uh, so that was a, one, of the, one of those guns is currently at Osborne House, actually. So it, it, it was a fantastic, if, if often forgotten, episode in the British Army's history. Yeah, and it, it allowed the Household Cavalry to sort of prove to people that they were capable of doing uh, something very successful like this because you know by then there hadn't been much action in the battle field arena for the household cavalry they were extraordinary big men apparently that was one of the things they were they were twice the size of the people they were fighting against so they were they were very impressive but they actually managed to pull this one off very successfully yes and if 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 if, if you're tall and and large, it gives you a lot of clout when you're uh, riding at 30 miles an hour with your sabre drawn towards the enemy. It's interesting that, that people like Seeley in the First World War, even right up to, to the 1940s, was claiming that the horse was irreplaceable. And we've talked about this already, the, the, the sort of debates in the British Army in the 1930s about the horse versus a tank. And the horse was very much embedded in the culture of the British Army. And then there was Omdurman. Yes, it was the punitive expedition by Kitchener against the Mahdi army. And it was a, a rather belated punitive expedition because it was about 13 years after the death of Gordon of Khartoum. But Kitchener arrived with his 8,000 regulars and his force of uh, Egyptians and Sudanese irregulars and 
paid hirelings. He had gun boats, he had field artillery, he had Maxim guns, and he inflicted huge losses, um, estimated to be about ten to 12,000 on the Mardi army that was about forty to 50,000 strong. So you know, you're talking 25% dead by the end of the day with very few uh, British casualties. But part of that action, as Kitchener moved towards Omdurman itself, was the great charge uh, by the 21st Lancers. Um, estimates claim about 310 to 400 um, Lancers with Lieutenant Churchill among them. And he was both a journalist and a soldier at that stage, which didn't please the Army High Command. But what they did was was charge what they thought were about 150 spearsmen to try and drive them out uh, from this gorge. But they charged, two minutes charge, and they discovered that beyond that was a larger force of about 2,500. So they get through their, a few British dead, and Churchill goes around basically with his mouth as a pistol shooting uh, dervishes in the face um, because he wasn't using a sword at that stage. Because he had injured his shoulder falling off a, a ship some time previously and so he couldn't use a sword very effectively so he'd purchased before travelling out to the conflict to um, a Mauser which has a, a 10 shot magazine which probably saved his life because if he was flinging a sword about he probably wouldn't have managed to survive the onslaught. No and I, th- I think he claimed that he killed three certainly one probably and two unlikely so <laughs> but uh, it's uh, is is quite ironic that I too fell off a ship uh, in Egypt and broke my leg so I feel <laughs> I feel he's a kindred spirit <laughs> I certainly and do. And I have a pin in my shoulder so, <laughs> so, so do I. The walking wounded so so we weren't quite so brave. <laughs> so, so it's often called the the, the last great cavalry charge uh, of the British Army, and it was certainly on a scale a proper cavalry charge. Whereas later ones, uh, the men certainly in the First World War in that great charge at Moroy Wood um, dismounted for the for the for the hand to hand fighting. Um, so this was this was truly a great. Cavalry charge. Yeah, and three VCs were awarded to the Lancers. Yes, so it was pretty good. And But I think they succeeded, uh, or at least survived, through luck rather than anything else. And and that is often the way with cavalry charges. You you don't know which way it's going to go. Okay, well, we you, you mentioned it, but uh, now we get close to and into the First World War, when um, obviously we come up against the uh, modern weaponry and the poor old cavalry trying to work out how they're going to take part in all of this. It was very difficult for the cavalry to fit in. Once it became trench warfare, there was really nothing for them to do. You could use the cavalry at the initial stages of the war and then at the later stages to try and exploit breakthroughs. But because communications were so poor, because logistics were so poor, because so many of the cavalry spent most of their time sitting around, getting the horses up to the point where they could mount a charge and exploit a weakness was very difficult. And you saw that in July 1916, the only cavalry charge at the Battle of the Somme. It was at High Wood when the Royal Deccan Horse, the Indian Regiment, charged with Lancer support. They had taken so long to get their horses to the front that the Germans moved back into the wheat fields with their Maxim guns. And so there were casualties. It's very difficult in those situations, and certainly those situations of total war, to use cavalry well. The most famous charge, as we said right at the beginning of this podcast, was the Moroy Wood incident with the famous warrior carrying General Jack Seeley. And that was truly a remarkable charge. And uh, warrior seemed to to absolutely love it. He he. Everyone described it uh, how he almost took off from the ground and and went into the gallop and led everyone. And Seely got to his signal post, and then the rest of the cavalry charged past him. And those were the Canadians. It must have been an extraordinary spectacle. And it was it was 
done to try and save the day to stop Ludendorff's army from mounting a sustained attack that could have forced the Brits back to the Channel ports and the French back to Paris. This was the big push um, in 1918 by the Germans. Yes, it was. And, and they lost a quarter of a million men very quickly. But the ridge uh, that Sealy wanted to capture would have dominated the Amiens road and, and caused huge headaches for the Allies. So it was an important charge and Warrior was right in the thick of it. And Marshal Falk wrote a letter about Warrior later saying, every time I see that horse, I I think of that amazing action. And it's hardly surprising that, that Warrior won the Dickin Medal. Uh, the animal Victoria Cross for valor, which which I've which I've seen, and uh, it's it's very moving. He was an extraordinary horse, and he survived until he was thirty three, and his obituary came out in nineteen forty one. So he he had a good long life and returned to the Isle of Wight. Unlike the a million or so other horses that died. Yes, and people forget the the huge cost in lives for horses. But in the Second World War, horses too were so important. Uh, we all know about Blitzkrieg and German tanks, but the Germans were still reliant on two million horses. Uh, 80% of their army was still pulled by horsepower. Yes. Well, we've talked about horses. What about camels, Jamie? Well, they too were incredibly important, particularly uh, in the hands of uh, Lawrence of Arabia and his forces and the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire. And it allowed him to move across the empty quarter. And of course, it allowed him to mount his famous attack on Aqaba, where he traveled across the 160 miles of the Sinai Peninsula in 49 hours, which you wouldn't have been able to do on a horse. And with 400 camel and their riders, he attacked Aqaba from a direction that the 300 Turkish and Egyptian guards were not expecting. Um, the, 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 one of the incidents that happened during that, of course, was that uh, Lawrence managed to shoot his own camel through the head with a pistol. Uh, so it could have done for him. But, but what's fascinating about that particular battle and all the other skirmishes and raids that Lawrence uh, achieved was that it was picked up by the military strategist Basil Littlehart, who started coming up with his theory of the indirect approach. And he took Lawrence's uh, actions and said, that's what the British army should do in the future. Don't get stuck in trenches. Be like a gas going around the enemy. What he, what he never quite addressed was the need to close and kill the enemy. And it infected and affected and informed British military strategy right up to the Second World War because we entered the Second World War without a decent tank. And you could, you could certainly argue that it's because of the concept of the indirect approach, that we weren't geared to fighting on the continent. We did everything we, did, we could to avoid it. And in fact, the attack on Italy that we mounted, uh, that Churchill pursued, uh, was, was a form of indirect approach. He certainly wasn't uh, a huge advocate for the Normandy landings. And oh, sorry, this is in the Second World. This is in the Second World War that he that he he managed to persuade the Americans to postpone it from 1943, and he certainly would have liked the Germans to collapse from a push up through Italy, but that that never happened. The Second World War, Jamie. I've heard people talking about the Polish cavalry charge. What was that? Well, there's a lot of legend and myth around those, and people have talked about them charging tanks. And yes, it probably happened in a few suicidal moments because that was what available at the time. But most of the incidents, most of the key cavalry charges where horses were used tended to be either against transport columns or against infantry. There's a famous episode, September 1939, where the 18th Pomeranian Ulan Regiment uh, attacked German infantry and managed to rout them. But it, that sort of incident was becoming increasingly rare because on the modern battlefield, the, the horse simply wouldn't survive. In total war, it wouldn't survive. And if you want high manoeuvre, high firepower, you're just not going to be able to do that with a horse. Even though 
General Seeley writing at about that time was saying, uh, scientists will disagree with me, but I still think the horse is the most flexible and important tool on the battlefield. And that again is the, the, the hope and wish of a great cavalryman. But modern warfare uh, wasn't really moving in that direction. Since then, there has been a use of horses, but they tend to be in guerrilla fighting environments, uh, in areas that are mountainous, rugged, where roads are bad, where logistics are poor. And you saw that in Afghanistan in 2001, where a dozen US Green Beret Special Forces hooked up with General Dostum's Northern Alliance cavalry. And there were about 2,000 horses in Dostum's forces. Uh, managed to do a lot of harm to the Taliban. They, they could speed around, they could get behind the static positions of the Taliban with their rusting old Soviet era tanks. And with forward air controllers and close air support provided by the Americans, uh, the cavalry actually managed to overcome quite a lot of opposition. But it was more like the fighting that the Boers were conducting back in 1900, 1903 against the Brits. That sort of guerrilla fighting does favour uh, smaller groups that are mobile on horses. A sad footnote to that was that some of Dostum's finest horses uh, were killed at the Kale Zhangi fort uh, when the Al-Qaeda and Taliban and foreign fighter prisoners who weren't properly disarmed when they surrendered uh, rose up and had to be quelled by the SBS and US Special Forces with close air support. And uh, some really wonderful horses were killed in that action. Yeah, so it's it's basically the marginal uh, uh, events, can, it could still apply, but really today... Um, the horse doesn't really have a, much of a place on the battlefield. Only in guerrilla conflicts or in mountainous areas, in the same way that mules are still extremely valuable in places like Afghanistan. And it's no accident that the muleteers, the experts in Europe today, are the Gebirgsjäger, the German mountain troops. Uh, so not only do they use uh, trains of mules, but they also have learnt the lesson that in mountain regions you need a uh, higher caliber, longer range rifle rather than the somewhat puny 5.56 millimeter caliber assault weapons of uh, the European theatre. Yes, well, I suppose the upside of it all is that it's nice to think that horses don't have to die in battle for us anymore. No, but they look damn good on a parade ground. They do. So, uh, conclusion. What is our conclusion, the cavalry charge? I think the conclusion is that technology has moved in and the cavalry has evolved. The cavalry regiments today are either in heavy tanks or in light reconnaissance tanks. And so, th those needs for the cavalry are still there, but they're simply filled by other means and other platforms, other vehicles. That's why, for example, the British Army is getting its new Ajax light reconnaissance tank. Uh, those roles are still there. Yes. Um, but just looking back to what we've mainly been talking about, cavalry action with horses, um, you know, if you were to sum up uh, the way that that uh, operated, what would you say? I think that you see an evolution of it. You see obviously success and catastrophic failure, you can see the weakness of it, the weakness in command, the weakness of recalling them once they're committed. As we said at the beginning, they were essentially a one-shot weapon. Yeah. That The flexibility today of the tank was obviously seen in operations such as Iraqi freedom uh, going in against Saddam Hussein's forces. But that was not just the tank, that was combined arms strategy and a lot of support from attack helicopters and close air support. So there we have it, uh, shock and awe, uh, hard to control. It's a one-shot thing, or it was a one-shot thing. Certainly, I think that the cavalry, um, in times when they weren't really able to spend a lot of money on it, or the cavalry were pursuing the baggage train rather than the orders of their leaders, uh, meant that things would go horribly wrong. But when you get a man like uh, Frederick the Great with von Seidlitz as his in man in charge of his cavalry. They were um, an incredible force on the battlefield and the winning shot.
So, um, uh, Jamie, any PSs, any postscripts? Yes, I do have something for you, Tom. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's always something. Yes, I do have something for you, Tom. It's not just cavalry, it, but it is about horsemen. And so what I want to mention is the Oprichniki, which you might not have heard about, but they are basically Russian. They were known as the henchmen or the selected, and they belonged to Ivan the Terrible. And you're talking about a totally psychotic uh, czar who would fry people alive in a giant frying pan and walk around and beat people to death with a metal pit tip staff. So you can imagine that his selected henchmen, and he lived with 300 of them in his uh, madder days, were going to be barbarous and appalling and so they were but 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 it fits into russian history extremely well uh, what they used to do was ride out cowled like black robed monks with human skulls around their saddles and with a severed wolf's head on their saddle representing the hounds of hell sniffing out treason against Ivan the Terrible. And they had a, an appalling reputation. I mean, in Novgorod, they killed 1,500 nobles, but they would kill peasants, nobles, middle classes alike. They weren't picky. And they tended to butcher people by impaling them, by roasting them over fires, by boiling them alive, and often just tying their their limbs to the four horses and riding in different directions and tearing them to pieces. So they were quite horrific. And, and this is sort of 1560s, 70s. Yeah, you're, you're yeah. talking mid-16th century. They, they, they represented the worst of, of Tsarist Russia. But you wind on 450 years, and what do you have? You still have the wolf's head motif because you have not horses this time, but mo motorbikes. You have the night wolves, the biker gang. So it's not just crime and bikes. They also have a PR side because they were involved in opening the Moscow Bike Show back in the 1990s. My brother actually met their chief, known as the surgeon because he used to be a, a plastic surgeon but who knows if he takes off faces uh, as a hobby as well and he said yes it's sex drugs and rock and roll all the way but it's actually more than that because u.s intelligence have identified them as a key conduit for providing and sending paramilitaries into the crimea as the spearhead for putin's occupation of the Crimea and its seizure from the Ukraine. So you can say half a million on, the Oprichniki are still alive and kicking. Hogs, not horses, though. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Bye. So it goes. My name is Tom Ashton. His name is James Jackson. You can view images relating to each podcast on our Bloody Violent History Instagram account and on our website, bloodyviolenthistory.com. Please subscribe, it's free, to our podcast on the app you use and to our mailing list via our website. This is very important as it boosts our rankings in the podcast charts. Thank you and good luck.